This is Between the Brackets, a MediaWiki podcast, episode 43, September 17th, 2019. Welcome to Between the Brackets. I'm Yaron Karen, and my guest for this episode is Olga Vasilova, who is the product manager for the Reader's Web team at the Wikimedia Foundation. Olga, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, where are you now? I am currently in Barcelona. Fantastic. Um, from what I understand, you grew up in Bulgaria, and then you lived in the United States uh, in Boston for a while? That's true, yeah. Um, I I kind of spent a lot of time going back and forth between the U.S. and Bulgaria, and then settled for oh, okay. university in the U.S. Yeah, okay. Um, your American accent is remarkably good, considering you didn't grow up grow up here. Um, how did that happen? Um, so there was there was definitely a lot of back and forth. So my um, my mother actually got uh, a green card via the lottery, which um, is one of those strange things that happens. So she actually moved right. to the U.S. when I was quite young, when I was around eight, um, and I stayed in Bulgaria um, mostly because at the time, you know, the education system was a little bit better there. But I would go visit in the summer, so I would kind of spend summers in the U.S. from you know when I was pretty young. So. I think the accent yeah. came from there. Yeah, that that explains it. Yeah, we have a, a similar background in that sense. Uh, I guess that was that was around the time I moved to the U.S. Although we all, we were also sort of moving back and forth. Um, uh, so, uh, so what were you doing before you joined the Wikimedia Foundation? Um, I mean, career career wise. Career wise, I was uh, so I was a product manager for a couple of. Um, different companies. I, I started in a company called Vecna, which was um, sort of interesting. It was a Boston-based company that uh, did a lot of a variety of things. Like I worked on robots and I also worked on kind of medical type software um, and also on different like kiosk type software, which was kind of interesting. Um, and then after that, when I moved to Barcelona, I similarly worked in the medical field, mostly around um, a company called MedTap that was mostly around uh, creating different apps for different pathologies. So a lot of it was um, psychiatric stuff, which I thought, which I found really, really interesting at the time. So we were working with um, different uh, therapies for borderline personality disorder and kind of other sort of personality disorders, which was which was interesting. Um, not, I mean, yeah. My, I feel like my work right now is a lot more satisfying to me, but there was definitely, I, I was definitely really interested in some of the more um, kind of experimental work that we were doing then, so. Were you doing software there? Yeah, we were doing um, different software. And then at Vecna, it was, um, it was software, but it was different. So we did everything from like basic software for, you know, we for like virus preventions and for hospitals to, um, you know, kind of the... UI for different robots, so like the software that you use to like interact with the robot and tell it to do stuff and things like that, which is kind of kind of cool. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah. Um, so when did you join the Wikimedia Foundation? I joined about three years ago now, um, August eighth. So it's been three years oh. and a month. It just it happened quickly. It's yeah. It's time to pass <laughs> quickly. <laughs> You feel like you just you just you're just getting your bearings or something or what? Um, no, I mean I feel I definitely feel like I've learned a lot. It's more um, a lot. I mean, in many ways, it's kind of the way the time passes. A lot has happened in that time, but also right. when you look at it all together, it's like wow, three years. That's that's a long time. I don't know. It feels yeah, it feels like eternity and two seconds all at once. Right. Um. So so now you're in the the readers web team. Um, it's it, just a, a little aside. It's kind of confusing. If you go to the page reading slash web on mediawiki.org, it says uh, the reading web team is in charge of the reading experiences on the web for the Wikimedia projects. And then right after that, it says learn more about the readers web team. Um, so I it's I assume it's not your fault, but I just had to point it out because I I was. I'm always bothered by naming ambiguity. Um, uh, yeah, but but the, the the name of the team is going to change anyway. It's not going to be reading web team or readers web team. 
Yes. So um, the, the foundation within product has been sort of loosely split into these two categories where um, something was uh, reading or readers um, and then editing and editors. And kind of the difference between reading and readers is um, reading with the original name. But I think um, uh, we the department altogether want to have a closer ties with the audiences and closer ties um, with kind of the users themselves. And so I think uh, they wanted to reflect that within the name. So it became readers as a way of sort of connecting to the audience a little bit more um, rather than reading, which seems a little bit more abstract. Um, but over time, even that kind of didn't quite make sense because we were in a position where last year, for example, we really wanted to focus on mobile editing as a department together. So all of a sudden, a lot of the people that would have classically been in uh, readers uh, were working on editing projects. And uh, similarly, people that were on the editing side um, were working on more reader-focused things. And so with time, this distinction has kind of stopped making sense, really. Um, yeah. And so I think the department altogether uh, is now called product, which makes a lot more sense than audiences, which was before. And then uh, this readers and editors, I think we're just probably going to end up with acronyms for the different teams that are in, in each one rather than kind of these distinctions that don't necessarily make sense anymore. Yeah, okay. When will you stay part of the the group formerly known as readers? <laughs> yes. I mean, are you going to stay more on the reading side? Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, same, same placement within the organization. Um, and I think that's mostly uh, just kind of due to the managerial structure. Um, but a little bit, the name, I guess, will be a little bit closer to reality, um, which is kind of yeah. nice. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to it in the sense that it, um, it does remove this distinction where it's like, oh, okay, well, we're, we're in reading. So that means that we don't talk to editors or we don't, you know, kind of have these connections with editors. Um, which I feel like isn't really true, um, especially with the work that we did last year, but also with everything, we've had a lot of conversations and a lot of things like that. So it, it feels a little bit, um, it feels a little bit more precise to have like an acronym or whatever the new name is going to end up being. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you can't really look at the interface from just a, just a reading perspective or, you know, the, um, there's no one person who's just an editor. I guess there are people who are just readers, but anyone can edit <laughs> as they say. Um, uh, so, um, so, so what do you do right now as product manager? So my position is, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it goes from sort of thinking about more high level stuff, uh, for the team and for the things that we're responsible for, which loosely is, um, most of the user facing stuff that isn't editing. So this is where kind of this readers, editors, uh, distinction comes in. So um, we look at a lot of the interface, a lot of the Chrome um, uh, at, on both mobile and desktop. Um, classically, we've really focused on mobile. So most of our work has done has been done on the mobile website uh, from the beginning, kind of building it out, but also introducing new features, etc. But we've also done some things in desktop, um, page previews um, from a couple of years ago being one of them. And uh, now we're starting to also really think about sort of um, the future of desktop and what we want to do with it, kind of the future of the vector skin and what's going to happen with that. So I think that's going to be our focus over the next couple of years. Yeah. Well, yeah. So that gets into um, what I want to ask you about. Uh, so you were just at Wikimania last month uh, where you were involved in a number of interesting talks, which I want to ask about. Uh, before that, what did you think of Wikimania as a whole? Was it your first one? Uh, no, it was it was my third actually. Um, I've been I've been oh, lucky okay. to go every year um, since I joined, which is I am lucky. Um, it was good. It, it yeah. was good. I thought um, I thought the idea of spaces was really nice because it sort of felt like there was more focus on particular subjects, on particular larger subjects. Um, and you know, it was always great great to see people and great to meet people. Um, one thing that I did. Um, think was a little bit chaotic is that like altogether the total number of sessions was a lot which on one side is really right. nice because there was like so much to choose from on the other side it felt like in, in another way it was almost um 
made it a little bit more difficult to talk to people that you wouldn't usually talk to um, because of the level of specificity. You could, you know, kind of very easily veer towards kind of the same people that you generally interact with and the same subjects rather right. than, you know, kind of going to the session that you know nothing about and learning something totally new. Um, although plenty of that happened as well. So I don't know. I, th- I thought it was I thought it was a really good Wikimania altogether. Yeah, cool. Um, uh, so, so the two talks I wanted to ask you about were um, one on improving the desktop interface and then one on improving the mobile interface. Uh, but then in the last episode of Between the Brackets, I talked to a guy named uh, Derek Jan Hartman or DJ. I don't know if you know him. Yep. Oh, okay, cool. You do, you do know him, yeah. Um, sorry for those who are uh, those who are hearing. I, I I can see Olga, so she, when, so she's nodding, but. <laughs> That's how I know that she's agreeing. Um, uh, yeah. So. Um, uh, so uh, yeah. So so uh, anyway, he's he's he was there. He's a volunteer developer. He was there at Wikimania. Also, um, I asked him what the what he thought the highlights of Wikimania were, and he said he really liked some of the research based talks. And actually, one of the talks he mentioned specifically was called "Dwelling on Wikipedia: Investigating Time Spent by Global Encyclopedia Readers," which turns out you were involved in too. Uh, so now I guess I need to ask you about three different talks. Um, uh, did you were you involved in any other talks, by the way, or is it just those three? Not just, but um, just those three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so I want to first ask you about the the desktop and mobile talks, um, which are both talks that you gave with a guy named Alex Hollander, who I guess is a UX designer at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, uh, she's nodding. Uh, so. Um, uh, although um, the, the the mobile interface talk was actually just half of a presentation, from what I understand, because uh, the Wikimania the Wikimania organizers took a talk by some visual editor developers, and they talked about improving visual editors specifically for mobile, and then yes. and then you two had a mobile interface talk, you and Alex, and then they combined them into one big talk. Okay. Yes. Um, I- yeah. So. So yeah. Okay. So that clarifies that. So so all those those talks were put on YouTube, but unfortunately there was a problem with the audio recording, so people can see the slides, but it but they can't really hear what you're saying in either of them, unfortunately. On both, um, yes. Different problems yeah. on each one, but. Right, right, yeah, yeah. One is static and one is muted. So I don't know. I, I you know, now that I do audio stuff, I can t- definitely sympathize with uh, with the, their issues. Um, but anyway, that's you know that's what this podcast is for to for to to get uh, for so people can learn about all of this uh, these initiatives going on. So um, um, so uh, so I want to start by asking about the mobile one. Um, you and Alex presented something called Advanced Mode, which I actually hadn't heard of before. Uh, what is that? Right. Um, so advanced mode is what we've been working on on this past year, and it's basically a way to bring a lot of the desktop functionality to mobile um, and with a focus on more advanced users. So what we're doing is basically instead of creating specific workflows for each thing, we're just kind of converting the pages from desktop to mobile and making them available. So if you opt into on advanced mode, which is out on all of the wikis now, you get things like article and talk tabs. Um, you get a link to the history page at the top of the page and a history page that looks very similar and has all of the functionality um, that you would see um, in desktop. And there's a couple of other features. Um, there's a lot. There's links to special all of the special pages. Um, there's links to um, other useful things. There's a user menu where some of those are collected. For example, like a contributions page or sandbox things like that. Um, there's also an overflow menu which has a lot of different article actions. So we basically what we did is we took all of the navigation. Uh, from desktop and try to squeeze it on mobile in a way that makes sense. Um, the reason it's advanced and the reason it's opt-in is because we really knew that for a new editor that might be a little bit overwhelming. So now we're in the steps of taking some of that and giving it to all editors um, while keeping kind of the more complex parts uh, for more advanced users. Um, even though it's only called advanced, anybody can opt-in uh, so long as you're logged in. And um, so far, I mean, so far, we've been really happy with the results, um, the retention rate. So basically, if you opt in, um, only about between 15 to 20 percent of people opt out once opted in, which is very high. And we're, huh. we're really happy with that. Um, and yeah, so far, we've yeah. gotten really good feedback. 
Um, so yeah, yeah, cool. Um, is uh, so yeah. I mean, is the idea that there will always be an advanced mode, or could this potentially, uh, you know, could you take most of it or all of it and 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 make it the default, or just make it part of the standard interface? So it depends. I mean, I think this is our first exploration to this idea of advanced mode, but I think over time we've been noticing that sort of the needs of more veteran editors and the needs of new editors um, and the needs of readers are kind of uh, separate. So for right now, we do think that it's going to stay at advanced, but something that I think we should look into sort of in the future uh, is kind of how we can split that experience. Like, what is the opposite of advanced? Because right now, um, what is not advanced is a basic experience where you can't actually perform those actions. Um, I think what we would like to have is, you know, if we do have this split between a more basic experience and a more advanced experience, the basic experience should still have all of those workflows, but they should maybe be a little bit more straightforward or a little bit more catered towards um, newer people, um, rather than not having the functionality at all. And I think that's kind of a line of thinking that we want to sort of explore in the future. For now, what we're probably going to do is uh, pull out the things out of advanced mode that make sense for everybody. So we're going to do the talk tabs, we're going to do links to the history page, but instead of having the full history page appear, we'll just have the mobile version, which is, you know, just kind of lets you see the diff. It's a little bit simpler so if you're new you know it's it's a little bit less overwhelming it feels a little bit more welcoming um and same thing and i think we'll also pull in the user menu so you have access to your sandbox but not necessarily access to something like recent changes which on mobile same thing even though it's we made it available it's a page that unless you know how to use it already very well it it's not a page that you should learn how to use on mobile yeah, right, right. It's it's it, right, right. It's it's not a, it's not essential to the experience, I guess. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, this whole advanced mode thing is defined within the mobile front end extension. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So mo- mobile front end for those who don't know, uh, it's an extension. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. It, it, it's an extension that checks um, if you're reading the wiki from a mobile device, and then it automatically applies its own skin. If so. I think it's hard coded to always use a skin name called Minerva or Minerva Noi. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So. Um, so it's a little bit confusing as well because we also um, so the connections between different extensions and mobile front end are sometimes different. But the way that AMC was built is um, you can still access AMC if you're um, using Minerva on desktop. So for example, if you have your skin, a- wait, AMC is advanced, advanced mode. A- 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 yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so if you have advanced mode, Which, yeah. um, and if you have, if you're for some reason you're using Minerva as your default skin on desktop, you can still um, opt into advanced mode. Okay. Oh, you're saying you can have wait, you can ad- so it's sort of part of the Minerva skin. Um, is what technically you're saying. it stands in between, but we do have a way for the Minerva skin to be able to 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 use it from from desktop as well. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Um, the separation between uh, mobile front end and Minerva is about 80% um, with some overlap. And I think some of the things that we want to do um, in the future is kind of making that separation complete. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, so actually the only MediaWiki site I really do mobile editing on is MediaWiki.org itself. Um, I looked, I don't see the advanced mode stuff there. I know it's on Wikipedia. Uh, do you know what that's about? Um, so basically time. Um, so we wanted to get it out to all of the Wikipedias first, um, mostly because mostly for traffic. And what we're doing right now is we're auditing all the other projects. Um, because unlike some of the, um, unlike the way that say the sidebar is a lot of the things for advanced mode have had to be hard coded mostly because um, a lot of the menu items and things like that. So we're basically doing an audit um, that will say, okay, well, we have this menu, this new menu here uh, with two items in it. Is that enough to have a menu or should we just have that, leave that in the sidebar? Um, and because right. of kind of the difference between those menus and the, what, what, contain, what they contain on the different projects, um, it's kind of a second step. Um, so we're going to probably audit and then probably bring it to some, but not all the other projects. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I assume people can't set it up yet on their own wikis. Um, as, they... as of now, not not yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it would be cool. I'm definitely looking forward to having on MediaWiki.org. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I would, I would love to see. Sometimes I have to switch to desktop uh, mode on MediaWiki.org because there's some features that I, that I, that I'm missing. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, she's nodding. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, um, the other, the other uh, big talk you gave was called uh, updating the desktop experience for Wikipedia. <clears throat> Although as a MediaWiki person, I think you instead could have called it updating the desktop experience for MediaWiki, but that's a, I, I know you, you know your audience uh, there at Wikimania. Um, so uh, that, uh, that project of improving the desktop experience seems to be at a much earlier stage than the uh, mobile experience project. Um, so um, uh, I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of discussion and user testing and all that kind of thing. Um, but I, I, let me put you on the spot. If you personally were redesigning the, the MediaWiki or Wikipedia interface right now, what kinds of changes would you make? Hmm. Well, so we just did a lot of interviews, so I have a lot of um, answers based on that and kind of on the research that we've done. But to me, I think the most important thing is to have um, a navigation that makes sense, uh, which is kind of the issue with... Um, the issue with Vector, in my opinion, is that a lot of, right now, a lot of it doesn't. That's, that kind of wants to, you know, that's kind of going to be our focus, I think, for the project is cleaning up the navigation and then some small, more like aesthetic cleanup that isn't necessarily, does not change functionality. So we don't want to change any functionality or do anything crazy. Um, but I think things that we do want to see is have things like search be more prominent, have languages be a little bit more prominent so they're not, they don't end up under the fold, for example, on, you know, on where on some wikis and some articles right now they do. Um, things we want to see is the navigation sort of makes sense. Like a lot of the items in the sidebar right now are not things that you use on a regular basis. Um, and a lot of them are, so kind of split that up and put the ones that are more used in a place where you can get to them easier and, you know, kind of hide, or not hide, still have them available, but have less prominence on the ones that are not that helpful, like the store, for example, or, you know, some of the other things oh, that right, right, are that right, are not okay. particularly yeah. useful. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so for, for search, for example, the idea is that it's like a floating search bar. That's what I understood from the slides. It moves as you scroll down Potentially. the page. So where we are right now is we're exploring sort of more ideas and we're less... While we have a couple of uh, prototypes that we want to bring to Wikimania to play with, um, I think right now we're more focused on identifying the things that make sense. So we know that we want to make search more prominent and we have one prototype that shows the way that that might happen, but we also might have another one um, later on after getting feedback that does that in a different way. Um, but yeah, the one right now is basically creating a sticky header that um, has a couple of things in it. So uh, it could have things like search in it. It could have things like, we're not sure about this yet, but things like the table of contents, for example, or the edit button. Um, or huh. the talk. Yeah. So if, as you're scrolling through the page, if you need to get to the talk page, you can click on that button. It will take you right there without having to go up and down all the time. Um, yeah. So that's definitely something that we're exploring, something I think is we're probably going to go with, but at this stage of the project, we haven't you know, kind of made any of those decisions. And we definitely, with this, we want a lot of feedback and you know, if anyone's interested, like there is a project page right now that has right now some of some of the ideas that we're working with and also a bunch of the research that we've got that we've gone through, um, which includes, you know, just both papers and research that we've had. But also we have like kind of a list of uh, gadgets and user scripts and other skin experiments that other people have done that we're sort of kind of stealing ideas from um, in terms of things that have worked. Uh, the idea is to like make the ones that do work and people do like kind of available to everyone rather than, you know, having them just be as a user script or just be as a gadget. Um, right. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. It's a, but like I said earlier, it's still very early. So 
the actual solutions themselves were not settled on. I think right now we are getting to the point where we're settling on the ideas of the things that we want to do, which which is good. Yeah. What, well, what is the time frame for the project? Um, so I think we're looking at about two years, um, although we're not entirely sure yet. It kind of depends on, you know, how we decide to build this from the technical perspective, which is what which is a decision that we're looking at right now. So is this going to be a new skin? Is this going to be uh, on top of one of the existing skins? That's kind of the main main decision we have to make. And if it is on top of one of the existing skins, which one? Um, and there's yeah. also, you know, once we have that decision, then I think we're going to have kind of another consultation, maybe an RFC, uh, a technical RFC around, okay, this is what we're thinking so far. It's very early. Does this make sense? And, you know, get, get a bunch of comments from that and then start kind of doing more per feature user testing. Yeah. Um, I had a, a Wikimedia Foundation designer named uh, Pau Giner on this podcast a while back. Mm -hmm. He also lives in Spain, appropriately enough. He does. Um, I guess not. Yeah. Two not, hours not all that south far of here. here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so I, I asked him this same question, uh, which is, um, what do you think about the criticism that Wikipedia gets that it's uh, either badly designed or simplistically designed or uh, outdated, that kind of thing? I think, I don't think it's badly designed. I think it was really well designed for its time. Um, outdated that, you know, at, I'm not, I'm not a designer, I'm a product manager, but outdated, I think that could have some truth in it. Most, but not so much from point of nothing works, mostly from the point of per perception. So there's, you know, as we're getting kind of a lot of new users and a lot of new editors, the expectation and their expectation of what the internet looks like has become a little bit different. Their standard has become a little bit different from what it was when you know, say the vector skin, what became default in, you know, 2010. And yeah. that is the kind of thing that we want to change rather than the way that the site works functionally. And especially with this project, that's something that we looked at in the beginning is no, like, we don't want to change the functionality, everything that we need to happen is there. And of course, we can add things and make space to add things in the future that we need. But in terms of having a redesign that, you know, adds a lot of stuff or removes a lot of stuff, that's not what we're looking for. We're mostly looking to do some cleanup and do some things uh, that make sense and create space for new stuff. So if we, for example, separate menus into like what their purpose is versus having all the links at once, that means that in the future, if we build something else, there's a space for it to go. So those are the kinds of things that right now I don't think that the site does very well. That said, the things that it does well, I don't necessarily think they should be touched. I mean, there's, while we might want an update, we also don't want to become a different site. And I think that's something right. that's like, that's very clear. There's, there's an identity and there's almost an aesthetic associated to it that could use an update, but that doesn't mean it needs to sort of be overhauled. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think I think Powell gave a similar answer, actually. I mean, not yeah, different specifics, but the same idea. Yeah. Um, so um, um, it's interesting um, that, uh, you know, for the the one of the goals of the desktop improvement, I guess, is to is to make the desktop and mobile experiences more similar. I, I don't know if you mentioned that, but I, I think it was in the slides. Um, uh, and then the, the advanced mode for mobile that we talked about is also trying to make the mobile experience more like the desktop one or just add some you know missing features, quote unquote, um, which I guess raises the obvious question. Do you think at some point there will be just a single you know responsive interface for people who know what that means that's intended for all screen sizes uh, and then you can just get rid of the mobile front end extension and just have you know the skin or that kind of thing? That would be really no nice. Um, but, uh, so I think we're moving towards that, but I think we also have to move one sort of one step at a time. And I mentioned kind of this decision that we're, this kind of technical decision that we're choosing 
uh, right now between, okay, where do we build this? And, you know, and especially we've had a lot of conversations of like, do we build something that's based on the vector skin or do we build something that's based on the Minerva skin? Um, in my opinion, we can get there, um, but I don't necessarily see it as a part of this project. I think uh, thematically, it will make more sense. Like thematically, we can have things that make the two sides seem similar. As we're creating new features, we can fe make features that sort of make sense for both. Um, but as a part of this, I don't necessarily see that as a goal. I definitely see it as if it happens. And if we do push in that direction, it would make things a lot easier for us in the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, let me see, do I want to ask anything about, it? That's about the responsive thing? I mean, the, well, so, so yeah, I mean, there already are, there are responsive skins, like timeless and that kind of thing. I mean, is, is, I don't know. I don't know. Do you see, um, uh, responsive, the, the timeless or anything else, you know, fitting in with the current, um, uh, initiatives, or is it too early to say? Um, it's too early to say. I mean, something that in terms of responsive skins, like something we're definitely concerned about is performance. Like right now, um, the mobile site is, while the skin itself is a little bit larger, the mobile site is like a little bit faster and lighter than, you know, basically loading all of the things the vector loads. So that's something that matters, especially oh, okay. if we're going to have one skin. That's something that we really want to think about that's, kind of not necessarily a huge issue with responsive skins but something that we have to think about um and there's yeah. also you know some other questions in terms of okay well we would like it to not only be in a perfect world we would like it to not only be responsive but also to be modular so for example there's certain things like um this idea of micro contributions where you make like really small edits to like pieces of text that things like you know the um the apps for example have been exploring um, that are really, really great for mobile, but are not necessarily so great for desktop. Um, so, you know, I think another part of that conversation in terms of responsiveness is not only responsive in terms of like the screen size and everything fits, but also like the, having the ability to like load individual features based on, um, based on the platform and the device that you're on. And yeah. that's a lit and, and at that point it gets a little bit trickier. Yeah. Okay. I hadn't. I hadn't heard of that that micro edits thing. I don't know if you mentioned it in in uh, one of your talks uh, there, but uh, I mean, what would the interface for that look like if it's not if it's different from you know regular editing? Um, we don't know so far, but I think it I think it depends. I think the apps have done a lot of work into looking into things from that perspective. I mean, I think editing Wikidata descriptions, for example, is something that's like fairly easy and straightforward. But also, oh, okay, yeah. you know, kind of, um, you know, there's ideas on, okay, I want to highlight this paragraph and just open the editor for this paragraph, or I just want to open the editor for this sentence and change a comma. And that's a lot quicker right. than like loading the entire editor um, and doing things like that. But also, is that the kind of functionality that you would want on desktop? I guess that's kind of the, um, it makes so much sense on the phone, but on desktop, maybe not. Maybe you want the whole thing. And I right. think those yeah. very mobile specific workflows do need more time to really be thought out and to be kind of designed for mobile rather than adapted from desktop to mobile, which is kind of what we did with advanced mode. Um, but I think because we did that and because we have a lot of that stuff that's just directly uh, brought over from desktop, that made things easier in terms of keeping the status quo, which sort of buys right. us time almost to um, to build some of these kind of more specific things. Because before it would be, it would almost feel silly if we were building them without even having a ba baseline where you could like look at the talk page without having to like scroll all the way down and do a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty clever, just, you know, highlighting a certain snippet of text and being able to, you know, uh, edit that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. That's, that's pretty neat. Um, is, there, is that a dog there, by the way? Uh, yes. Is that? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Big dog. Um, oh, okay. Oh, great. Um, so, yeah, okay. So, so I, I want to ask about the third talk, too, which, again, is called uh, Dwelling on Wikipedia, Investigating Time Spent by Global Encyclopedia Readers. Uh, which at least one developer thought was the highlight of the whole conference. Um, so 
was it you helped collect data for that one? Um, a little bit. So we so this started um, when we were working on page previews, which is um, I guess some some of the listeners might know, but it, for those that don't, it's like it was also known as hover queries, the thing that you hover on, a little box pop, box pops up. You click on it, you go to the article. Um, so when we were building out that feature and deploying it, we really wanted to have a metric that we could use to see how um, using this affects session length and affects like how long you're spending on the page. Um, because one of the theories was that, okay, well, because you have uh, more context, you'll actually read deeper into each individual page. Right. Can you hear me okay? There is a... A barking dog in the yeah, background. Yeah, I can hear it, yeah? and, and okay. I hear the dog too. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Um, yeah. So, so we created this metric um, that is basically not, not the first pet on this podcast, by the way. There's, there have been other people. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Good to know. Um, so yeah, so we created this metric um, basically to um, measure that. And then we realized at some point that, wow, we are up until that point, we actually weren't measuring how long people were spending on pages at all. Um, so oh, okay. slowly we d decided to, you know, kind of put a little bit more significance on it and kind of look at the data just from an overall perspective rather than from just the perspective of, you know, how, what is it doing for this feature? How is this feature affecting it? And so... Um, we ended up uh, getting a contractor um, who was Nate. He's from the University of Washington to sort of actually uh, okay. do a deep dive into the data. Um, yeah. With you know a couple of questions, a lot of them were overall questions, but the one that the presentation was uh, kind of mostly focused on was this idea of how reading time changes um, based on um, sort of based on wiki and based on geographies. Um, and something that we noticed um, that was kind of one of the m more interesting results is that um, when you look at uh, geographies from, I mean, the quote unquote global south um, or, you know, just in general countries with lower um, HDI, people tend to actually read for longer and they tend to be a little bit more engaged, um, which is interesting because we don't necessarily know why that is happening. But the, uh, another study made by the research team sort of noticed uh, a similar pattern where a lot of um, replies that were coming from places like um, India or South America, uh, a lot of the people there said that they were more likely to use the projects for, uh, for school purposes or for work purposes uh, rather okay. than kind of the more Western, um, the more Western countries that uh, were more likely to say that they were using it for entertainment. Um, so, the, yeah. and this was really kind of supporting that idea. So, um, we wanted to dig a little bit further into that and that's what we saw that people were spending longer, um, both, uh, when they were using their phones and, and when they were on the computer. So it wasn't even just, um, so to us, we think it's not, you know, just because maybe they have a phone, so it takes longer, um, because we saw the results on desktop as well. It wasn't as significant, but we saw, because we saw it on desktop as well, like that's, it's not quite, we think that it's not quite the phone reason. Um, we don't have the exact reasoning. I mean, we probably have to, you know, kind of create different studies around that, but that's the kind of main result of the paper. Yeah. Uh, you went, you mentioned HDI before, I think. Uh, yeah. Or, it's, what is that? Um, it's human development index, which is, um, oh, okay. Basically, a very rough measure of development based on um, based on different variables. Um, it's not necessarily. We use two different indices for the paper. Uh, I would like to have a disclaimer that says, you know, these kinds of things are, or these kinds of measurements in general um, can tend to be biased. Um, and don't take, you know, kind of everything into consideration. So while, you know, I, I still think the results are super interesting because of that, but it is kind of a disclaimer. Like HDI does not necessarily say everything about a country. Um, it, it also doesn't, you know, show uh, patterns uh, within the country. So, I mean, that's, that's another thing is that, you know, sometimes internal uh, inequality can cause different kinds of patterns as well that are not reflected right, in something okay. like HDI. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, what, did anything else surprise you about the findings, just in terms of, you know, the amount of time people spend on Wikipedia altogether? Or, uh, um, I don't know. I don't know how it was subdivided, but... Uh. Nothing too crazy. Uh, it's pretty low. Um, 
but people definitely tend to spend the longest on their last page, uh, which kind of raises this theory of like, okay, does that mean that they're looking for something specific and they're just like clicking through articles until they find something that they find what they're looking for and then keep reading that? Or it could also say, okay, well, maybe they were uh, going down a rabbit hole and they just ended up on something that was so interesting that it, you know, kept their attention. But that is a pattern that we see is, you know, people tend to click through and at some point like end on one article and just read that for a little bit longer. Yeah, okay. Um, of course, it could just be that they they just keep the browser open there and switch to another tab or something. Or is that is that not? Um, so we were yeah. So we were filtering yeah. We were filtering those out. Um, not oh really okay. super well, but we were trying to um, in the sense that we would uh, cut the time. If there was another browser window on top, we could tell. Um, if oh, okay. you just left your computer, we couldn't tell, but we would have the clock time out after. Um, I think. I don't remember the exact number, but we had the clock t- uh, time out after some amount of time, and then just removed those sessions from the um, from the data. I get it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. Um, so, I-, I mean, is there any chance that this kind of, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, statistical analysis research can help with the whole re- redesign thing? Obviously, you're doing specific user testing, but in terms of just, you know, aggregate numbers and stuff. Um, it depends. This one in particular is a little bit different, um, mostly because I think this kind of data almost, um, makes more sense in terms of, um, the content itself. So for us, okay, we know that more people spend time from many different data points. We, mo- we know that people generally spend the most time in the top of the article because that's when, you know, that's kind of the parts that they're looking at. That's where they're reading. And in, if, you know, if their average session is like 10 seconds or something, most of that is in the top of the article. Um, so we know from a sense that the top really matters. At the same time, in terms of um, making changes to desktop, that's not necessarily... We know that we can put things like a bigger search bar there. We know that we can put things like, um, you know, language switching. So get them in the beginning to switch a language if, if it's not their language. Uh, but I think what's more, most important there is the content itself. Um, and I know that there's been a, this conversation among editors for a very long time. But uh, what is written in the first paragraph of an article is of vital importance, um, I think, to sort of the perception that that article is going to have on a reader and also to whether they're going to continue reading it or not. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. I mean, how does that affect, <laughs> how, how, does, how does that knowledge affect uh, policies or anything um, or, or design? I don't think it affects design in terms of um, this project, I think. I guess that's what I was saying. I mean, I think we'll be affected by the other things, the more Chrome type things that we can put there, like menus and different stuff. We'll be affected by that. Um, but I think the result should be um, uh, should also be shared with people that are creating articles or that are editing, you know, kind of uh, the first couple of sentences to make them a little bit clearer and things like that. And that's kind of outside of our uh, outside of our realm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um- so uh, you, you you said for the for the desktop redesign you're looking for you're you're no you know right now soliciting feedback and that kind of thing. If people want to give feedback about you know what they think the, the the desktop experience should look like, where can they go? Yes, so we have a project page. Um, um, let me, I I will read it out. Uh, we have a project page on MediaWiki, and it is called Desktop improvements um so it is there it is um reading slash web slash desktop improvements on um mediawiki.org okay cool i'll I'll, I'll have a link to that from the the episode uh, page um and p- so people should go on the, the talk page for that or something? Um, the talk page for that would be great. Uh, we're also, so during Wikimania in the first two days, we did about um, 20 interviews with um, with different attendees where we kind of showed them the prototypes, et cetera. 
Um, so we will yeah. probably be posting in the next couple of weeks, we'll probably be posting the prototypes that we shared as well as the results from the interviews. Um, so after that, also any, um, any kind of feedback on the prototypes or feedback on the design ideas that are on the page itself. Uh, would be really helpful. Um, we're also collecting uh, research on this topic, both research that the foundation has done, but also, like I mentioned, um, we're trying to get a kind of uh, comprehensive list of past efforts that sort of fit this theme of kind of easier navigation um, uh, and kind of a cl having a cleaner interface. So any user uh, scripts that have been created, uh, gadgets or any more information, you know, uh, would be helpful. Like, hey, this person was interested in this thing and, you know, maybe they're a good person for you to talk to. Um, anything like that would be really helpful for us right now. Cool. Um, so what, one thing that comes up on this podcast, uh, whenever I, I, I talk, or not whenever, but often when I talk to Wikimedia Foundation developers is... Um, is you know just the the challenge of having you know m you know literally millions of stakeholders um uh, which can make it difficult to finalize any decisions uh, because there's uh, there's always the chance that that the some section of the user community is going to uh rebel against it or um um, I don't know, there's always a lot of obstacles to finalizing a decision because, the, you know, there's always more discussion or debate and so, so forth that can be done. Um, are you worried about that kind of thing? Is I mean, is there a clear sense of, you know, once we've, once we've made the decision, then we feel authorized to just do it and, and, and that's it? Um, no, <laughs> not quite. I mean, the way I don't, the way that I would like to see this project go is um, to get, you know, people that are interested engaged as early as possible. So anything that could come up as an issue, we could have that conversation then. I don't necessarily want to, and even with the changes that we're planning on making, I, I feel like I really want um, to see us do a more uh, sort of progressive uh, deployment strategy where we have, okay, we're thinking about this feature, we're going to do a prototype on it and get a bunch of feedback. Okay, feedback is good. We're going to deploy it here. Is that okay? Um, versus, you know, kind of building out this entire thing and then like kind of forcing it on people one day without necessarily them having heard about it before or anything like that, which I think is, you know, a li which I think is kind of potentially a little bit more uh more controversial because right you know right. because people were not informed um on the other hand my worry is that you know even if we have this approach it's still going to be difficult to like have people engaged and in the loop as this is happening like enough to to basically pay attention i mean to the to the to the, what we're doing so it we want to limit any kind of element of surprise and I'm hoping that that right. works. I'm hoping we do uh, enough in order to make that um, to make that actually true. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. I mean, it certainly seems like you're 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 putting in the work now to uh, to prevent surprises and you know make sure that you that you're doing something that everyone uh, is is going to like or not everyone, but it's never everyone, but uh, uh, a lot of people, most people. Yeah. And. Um, um, and, and it is going to be, I mean, uh, one thing that we are definitely sure about is that we're not, you know, we're, we won't be removing any of the existing skins. So, you know, if you don't like it, you can, you'll always yeah. be able to have whatever skin that you use right now. Oh, well, so in that case, I, I guess you, you, uh, that would be an argument against uh, applying these changes to, say, Vector. Um, so if we do it in Vector, it's probably going to be some layer on top. So it's probably going to be some kind of uh, a set of feature flags that are bundled into one setting so you can turn it on and off. Um, uh, so that way it won't be a new skin, but it will live within Vector, but it will be... It, it will function like changing skins. It'll, there'll be one toggle somewhere where you can turn it on and off. And it'll be, you know, old Vector and new Vector or something like that. Right, right. Okay. Um, cool. I think that's all my questions. Um, is there anything I, mi I missed? Anything you want to talk about as far as uh, MediaWiki design? Anything else? 
Um, no, I mean, nothing, nothing I can think of right now. Yeah, okay. Actually, I want to ask, so you, you're also, uh, I guess, now that we got technical stuff uh, done, are, are, you're also a DJ, is that correct? Um, yes, well, it, it used to be correct. I, I actually haven't, I haven't done um, much recently, but yeah, I used to do radio, um, and then afterwards I had a podcast uh, for um, a couple of years, so I did radio for maybe eight years, and then I had a podcast afterwards for two or three years, but Unfortunately, I haven't done it cool. in the past six months or so. I I do I do miss it a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is the podcast still online? Can people see it, hear it? Uh, yeah. It was called um, Noisage, um, and uh, yeah, it should be somewhere on Mixcloud. Cool. I'll have a link to it. Uh, uh, yeah. What what yeah what what kind of music? It was were you yeah it was fun. It was um it was a lot of punk rock, just kind of from throughout the world, as well as some kind of more uh, experimental like electronic music. Um, so weird avant garde stuff from the eighties and things like that. It was which is kind of fun. Yeah, it was um it was me and a friend of mine, and she was more into the experimental side. I was more on the uh, louder, loud stuff side. Um. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. We used to do it at a radio station here in Barcelona called Radio Bronca. Um, and then after that, we moved it to a podcast. Cool. Man, that is really cool. Any, any, any bands that people might have heard of or, or, or not heard of? Uh, the people might have <laughs> heard of. I don't know. That depends, that depends on people. Um, well, it's sure, sure. There's definitely a lot of different kinds of things that were played. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of local stuff from Barcelona, which is always fun, and um, yeah, other things, past and present. Oh well, right, right, yeah, yeah. I, I, hopefully, you can start up the podcast again and do something else because uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, this is a technical podcast, of course, but I, but it's still uh, you know I, I get I I can see why people enjoy uh, putting out content like that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um. Uh. All right. Uh. Great. So. Um. Yeah. The. Uh, I guess that wraps it up. Um. Uh. Thank you very much, Olga. It was great to talk to you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And this has been another episode of Between the Brackets. I want to again thank my guest Olga Vasilva of the Reader's Web Team at the Wikimedia Foundation. Thanks to all of you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it, and see you next time.